HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Jewel by Chef Steps is a proud sponsor of Beer Sessions Radio. Jewel sous vide is the future of the kitchen. Jewel, perfect food every time. Learn more at chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E. I'm HRN's Executive Director, Katie Mosman-Wadler, with a preview of this week's episode of Meat and Three, our weekly food news roundup. This week, we're looking at the way labels shape our perspectives on food. I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but is it acceptable to judge a wine by its label? There are some labels that I'd say are so bad they're good. As long as your paperwork's in good shape, you'll get a grass-fed label. Tune in to this week's Meet and Three on Heritage Radio Network. That's meet plus sign T-H-R-E-E. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey guys, guess what? It's Cider Week, New York City, and this is a special State of the Cider Industry podcast. So we are psyched to be here on November 6, 2018. Cider Week's come so far. I mean, there's people here like Eleanor Legere. Hi, Eleanor from Eden Ciders. Hey, Jimmy. You know, we go way back, uh, first Cider Week in New York, 2011. And uh, Gideon Call from uh, Original hey, Sin Cider. It's great to have so many great connections. And, and there's newer friends. Uh, Ron Sansone, you had the Drinking Cider blog. Now you've opened your own cidery, Spoken Spy in Connecticut. How are you, Ron? Doing good. Doing good, 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 man. And then it was like the newbies, like uh, Kyle uh, Scherer. We met you when you were making cider at Millstone. And now you've been in the Hudson Valley with Graft for a few years. So this is such a just a little yep, snapshot right of... The whole industry and Jen Smith from the, the New York Cider Association, who's also running the Cider Weeks. How are you, Jen? I'm very Let's well. Let's get your voice on. Um, and this has been a very unique uh, show. We've got two Collins, Michelle McGrath uh, from the United States Association. Eleanor, tell us about Michelle. I don't really know what her role is and exactly what that association does. Yeah, so the United States Association of Cider Makers started um, as a small group, maybe 35 people out in Portland, Oregon, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. 2011. Things have gone so far, <laughs> so fast. Um, and it was an all-volunteer organization. And then um, just a couple of years ago, we hired Michelle as the executive director. So she has really helped bring a level of professionalism to the organization. And we've got a strategic plan and things are happening. Great. So there's it's going to be a lot. Of, we don't always have call-ins, but we're going to have a number of call-ins on the sh- on the show and that's going to be a double episode so we'll be talking for the next two hours so um i think our first call in michelle mcgrath uh you're on the line i am here great so um i'm not as comfortable with the call in so give us a little spiel you know tell us what what your job is and some of the uh, initiatives you guys have at the u.s association Absolutely. So like any executive director, it's my job to implement the vision of the board of directors. And we worked very hard to have a board of directors that accurately reflects the diversity of our cider industry. So we have small producers, large producers, modern urban producers, um, rural orchard-based producers, and they're from all various parts of the country. 
So that board has worked together to create a vision and a strategy for achieving that vision to grow the cider industry across across the board, across styles, across um, um, regions, across different consumer bases. We, we want the cider market to continue to grow. And the initiatives that we are implementing in order to achieve that, first and foremost, our number one directive is policy-related. So some of the biggest challenges that the cider industry faces has to do with either labeling regulations or uneven and perhaps some would even say unfair excise taxes that the cider category faces. And that's what really brought the cider makers together in 2013 and 2014 to form an association is that we realized as a growing industry, we needed to consolidate our political power so that we could create some change. So that's something that we're constantly working on and pushing forward. Michelle, the other initiatives, yeah. you know, when uh, we're thinking about this show and today is election day, I kept writing on my notes, vote for cider. So in, in a sense, <laughs> we need to vote for cider, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you need to be speaking with your congressional representatives and your senators to make sure that they are supporting the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act because it was um, approved with a sunset period last year and it's going to go away and, and we need to make it permanent. And so you need to talk to your congressional representatives and make sure that they're supportive of that bill and tell them how important it is to your industry if you are a cider maker. Great. Um, Eleanor Lejeur from uh, Eden Ciders here. She has a question for you, Michelle. Yeah, Michelle, um, hi. Hi. <laughs> and uh, um, also, I think what's cool is, you know, it started with legislation, but there's also things that you do for trade and for consumers. Can you also talk a little bit about those, too? Yeah, absolutely. So we always talk about USACM as a three-legged stool, advocacy, education, and membership. So what Eleanor is talking about is our education leg. So a, a lot of what we do is try to create a common language for the cider industry to use, and the purpose for that is to help consumers better understand cider. And the way we do that is um, through a program called the Cert- Certified Cider Professional Program, which your listeners may be familiar with Cicerone or Sommelier. There's a certification program for people in the service industry to learn more about our cider category, about the beautiful nuances within it, about the diversity within it, and then be able to pass that knowledge on to curious, inquiring customers. And that customer will leave more informed and will purchase more cider as a result. That's great. And so... Uh, Another piece of that is what we call our Cider Lexicon Project, and we released the first Cider Style Guide with 10 styles last year. And the main thing that it created was two overarching categories for heritage and modern ciders, modern ciders being bright and refreshing and made with modern culinary or dessert fruit, and heritage ciders being complex with tannins and made with traditional cider fruit. And we'll be releasing version 2.0 in just a couple of weeks. We've got a few exciting updates. So um, those are some of the educational efforts that we have towards trade um, and consumers. And, and then, of course, CiderCon is our annual conference, which is the premier cider industry event in the world. People come from dozens of countries every year, and it's growing every year. And it's going to be in Chicago in February, and we hope everybody comes. That's great, Michelle. Uh, Guy on call from Original Sin Insider here. He has a question for you, too. Uh, let's see. Just uh, point out that both Eleanor and I went to the first CiderCon in 2011, I believe, where there might have been 35 <clears throat> people in a room, and it's amazing that it's grown to the point where it is the envy of the world now. And I think one actually interesting aspect of <clears throat> CiderCon, like you pointed out, is that not only do you get uh, the le- cider... Uh, uh, cider kind of attracts many different levels of people, including people with agricultural backgrounds, a lot of orchardists going, as well as uh, people with wine backgrounds and people beer. with beer backgrounds. And it makes it a particularly interesting event. Um, so my question to you is how do we – currently, cider represents 2% of the, about 2% of the beer industry. How do you foresee us to continue growing the category in general? One of the best 
uh, things that we can do to continue growing the category in general is to remove some of those barriers um, and to continue education. So it's really those two core pieces, advocacy and education. We have to keep pushing them forward. If cider makers are paying unfair taxes, then their prices are going to be higher, and that's going to translate to fewer sales. So we have to keep pushing for lower excise taxes for cider, and then we have to keep educating consumers about what cider really is so we don't have consumers going into bars and asking to order a cider beer, right? Like, that's a problem. Cider beer. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So our category is just, it's really misunderstood, and it's misunderstood by consumers, and it's misunderstood by regulators, and it's misunderstood by legislatures. So education across the board is, is really where it's at. And, and, you know, USACM is really charged with federal advocacy, but we really need people to not only be involved in the national association, but to also simultaneously be involved in their regional associations, because I am concerned that there will be changes at state level in, in state level laws, such as franchise laws, that could really harm local growth of cider in those states and regional associations need power too. So when cider makers are writing their marketing budget for the year, they should put their regional and national dues into their marketing budget because that small piece is going to really, in the long run, translate into viable cider market. Michelle, I I like what you're saying. This is great. Um, We also have uh, Jen Smith from the New York Cider Associations here. She has a question for you too. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Jen. Um, I have been thinking a lot about, as you know, we, the New York Cider Association, has heartily embraced the USACM style guide. I think it's really valuable and effective to have those style designations. Here in the Northeast, particularly in New York State, where the apple industry is such an important part of the economy, um, we see that, you know, modern cider contributes uh, to stimulating the economy, creating jobs, preserving farmland. Uh, and so we're, you know, we are uh, working with cider makers that are both heritage and modern cider makers. Something that I've heard is a sort of false binary between modern and orchard based. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. So to put it another way, I think that you can have a cider that is both modern and orchard based. And in fact, a lot of the cider that's being made in New York state is exactly that. And so just interested in your thoughts. Yeah. You know, I get this question from modern cider makers often and um, I I think part of it is maybe just a little self-consciousness from conversations in the past where there was a r- real tension between the two groups. But I, th- I think Eleanor and Gidon, you can probably both speak to lessening tensions between those two groups as time has gone on. And I think recognizing that although the categories are different, they're both excellent and making good cider can be made from any kind of apple. It's all about balance. Um, so uh, yeah. we are making some small tweaks to the language that of how we describe modern cider in our style guide to try and underline this because it was never our intention. Eleanor was involved in the creation of the style guide. She can she can vouch for this. It was never our intention to create that false binary and you know everybody thinks their product is the best so some of that is coming from cider makers themselves but that's certainly not the opinion of usacm thank yeah, you Michelle. I, th- I think the orchard based cider term i know the orchard based cider term originated from what we would now call heritage cider makers and from the beginning my perspective was always at you know any app any cider made from apples grown in an orchard is an orchard based cider um right and so uh i think what the style guide did was to create the term heritage which is hugely helpful and from my perspective you know um all, all of us who make cider want to celebrate orchards because without them we don't have cider so yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say how, how exciting it is for me because the, the time that i've known you i think for years we had conversations you guys toured around. Some of your members were talking about the labels, fine cider, yeah, orchard real based cider, cider, fine cider. We were, we couldn't like get our 
ourselves out of our way to do it. And Jimmy was like, come on, you just need a term. But it, it's exciting that, that there has been some, some definitions. Yeah. Um, you know. On that note, there actually, people aren't aware that in 1997, there was a meeting in Atlanta with a tent of a starting a National Cider Association. And literally for two hours, we argued whether the association should be called the Hard Cider Association or the Draft Cider Association. So I think, <laughs> you know, one thing is important is more we have in common than, than, than not. And I think that's one of the things that, that CiderCon has brought, has brought us all together. I, I will say one thing. I w I'm doing an event on Friday, on Saturday called Cider Feast in New York City. And I got, actually got an email and said, Someone actually wanted to know if I would have would have hard ciders at the event, <laughs> and I said it was hard alcoholic ciders. Um, I just wanted to add also, I, um, one of the things I think is really unique about the United States Association is the um, very conscious effort from the beginning to make it a big, big tent organization. Um, yeah. And I was in England um, in June, and you know the association there is just the large producers, and the little ones weren't. For years, we're not allowed to be part of it. It's a very different feeling kind of market, and I think it's a real tribute to the people who got our organization going that they, from the beginning, wanted to make it a big tent. That's great, Michelle. We have one more question for you, uh, Kyle Shearer from Graft Cider. Hey, Michelle. Uh, it's Kyle. Hey, Kyle. I uh, didn't make it to the 2011 um, first CiderCon, <laughs> but I made it to the 2012, <laughs> and I believe I asked the same. Uh, outspoken at 22 years old. Um, you know, I think that the current legislation goes goes a far way for the majority of the cider industry. But, you know, when we're talking about small producers and even kind of the UK where they are very much based on this on this taxation system that um, doesn't that kind of doesn't allow innovation because it raises the rates considerably. If you start adding other things into the cider, um, is there anything kind of in the future that if we get past the sunset period um, as far as and, and I'm speaking to the to, past apples past um past peri pear or pears in general adding other fruits or other adjuncts things that you know especially in, in my my uh realm um do very well and the things that we're very interested in and we still think it's you know cider to an extent um where does you know where do you see kind of legislative es uh, efforts and then style guides kind of coming in to kind of represent these styles as well Great question, Kyle. Well, you know, if you look at the current USACM style guide, we've got spice ciders, we've got fruit ciders, and we'll be adding some more specialty ciders with version 2.0 to be coming out soon. So um, USACM recognizes that flavored and fruit ciders are uh, a big part of the U.S. cider industry. In fact, with regional cider brands, last quarter, other cider flavors, so other than straight apple or other than straight pear, grew 46% last quarter. I mean, that is really insane growth. We, we are seeing a lot in this category. Um, and, you know, I always like to think, okay, so I've got, a, I've got a glass of apple cider. I've got a glass of apple cider. I'm paying about a quarter a gallon on taxes for that glass of apple cider. Then I add blackberry juice. So now I've got a glass of, of, of apple cider that's back sweetened with blackberry juice. Suddenly, I'm paying over a dollar a gallon in taxes. Uh, then I add carbonation. <laughs> uh, now I'm paying three dollars a gallon in taxes. Now I add malt, and suddenly I'm considered a beer, and I'm paying less than a quarter a gallon. Like there's something seriously wrong with that, the way that exists. And, all, and, good news. and to, to, on the flip side, I mean, with all these um, all these, you know, sparkling seltzers coming out that are traditionally malt based, you know, I think it's it's important for, you know, cider to kind of still stay as the uh, traditional 100 percent fruit based option, especially with this gluten free um, kind of market. That's great. Michelle, that was a real great intro. Um, we are going to come back and just talk in studio for a little bit. So thanks so much for joining us. That was a great uh, rundown of the taxes. Uh, I guess everyone's going to start putting malt in their cider, right? <laughs> well, um, it has happened, actually. Unfortunately, we've lost cider brands that were really successful to F&Bs because 
people started paying less taxes by adding malt. So unfortunately, that's a, that's a real thing. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. And quickly, um, we just tasted a cider. Jen, what was it? Yeah, we have uh, Eden's Cinderella's Slipper. Ooh. And I was talking to Jordan Warner. Uh, she said that you guys had done a special tasting with your Eden's Cinderella Slipper with what? <laughs> we were in an awesome Filipino restaurant. We had marabouns, and it was kind of a... Uh, a luge effect. So you pour the cider <laughs> down the, the marrow bone. bone and, your, yeah. I like that. That's a sexy pairing. And on that <laughs> one, we're, we're going to take a short break, drink some more cider, be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio, State of Cider Industry. All right. Woo. Here on Beer Sessions Radio, we care about what you're drinking. And we want to help you out in the kitchen, too. For real. There's one smart kitchen appliance that makes cooking simple. The Joule Sous Vide. Joule uses precise temperature control to take the guesswork out of cooking. So steak, chicken, seafood, pork, roast, eggs, veggies, all come out exactly the way you like them. Joule comes with hundreds of step-by-step -step recipes and guides for endless inspiration. Bring out your inner chef without any effort. Joule, perfect food every time. To get yours, visit chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E and use our code HRN to get $15 off for a limited time. That's chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E, code HRN. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to the special State of the Cider Industry Beer Sessions Radio episode on the Heritage Radio Network. So we just spoke with Michelle McGrath from the United States Association. And one more time, Eleanor, tell me about this association. I know the Instagram handle is at pick underscore cider, hashtag pick cider. That's kind of new to me. This uh, whole national association is, is news to me. Um, yeah, well, it's, um, uh, you know, Michelle talked a lot about the different initiatives, and one of them is pick cider, which is just to get people to pick cider for Thanksgiving as the most obvious place that one would naturally pair cider with food. And any, anything that came up in this conversation, because we're going to have another call in uh, in a little bit with um, Mike Beck from uh, Uncle John Cider in Michigan. Geden? You know, I think that Michelle's point that, uh, you know, the cider con has really become the envy of the world, even though, you know, U.S. is now, uh, cider is 2% of the beer world, and in England, in, uh, cider represents 18% of beer sales. The British come here and go to our cider con and go back and realizing that what we're doing here, the energy and the youth of our cider industry is really very unique. That's one thing you, anyone, I recommend anyone really interested in the cider category is worth going to. to so it's, it's interesting, you're, you're comparing the share of the market to the beer industry. Yeah. Tell me why and why you think that way. You know, that is, that is really the statistics uh, that's been given as far as to get a sense of where we are in the U.S. and where, where we potentially can grow to. Um, you know, if you look at the statistics, a lot of... Uh, it's amazing how many countries in the world have grown and the per, cap per capita consumption is quite significant. And, you know, in order to support the, eight, as of this, the beginning of this year, there's 821 cideries. In order to uh, support the number of cideries out there, there's no doubt that the cider industry has to grow in order to make all, all the businesses viable. Awesome. I, yeah, I just wanted to, to speak that. I just did a talk over in the UK. I was brought over by Imbibe. Um, so I kind of talked about, you know, obviously through the lens of graft somewhat, but just, you know, uh, how 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 much the cider industry has changed, and one thing that, you know, I said that the American producers have as a boon is not only the tax system, but it is the ability to um, to be able to cherry pick all the best traditions from the the UK and France and Spain, and then get to pick everything that we like about the styles, and then we get to layer on whatever we want because it's American, and God bless creativity here and initiative. And you see that in New York with uh, you know Brooklyn Cider House having a Spanish theme to their their product. And also, every, everything this cider week, I mean, Jen Smith, is is so interesting. There's there's quite a number of food and beer, I mean, food and cider pairings. I know Brooklyn Cider House is doing stuff. Um, Kite and String from Finger Lakes is down at Farm on Adderley doing a pretty cool dinner. Yeah, dinners uh, and deliberate pairings, uh, whether at, with the course or the dish, flights, etc., at restaurants have always been a core component of Cider Week because we feel that cider, you know, deserves a place at the table and that cider more so than wine or beer really makes food sing, which is not to say I don't enjoy a beer or a glass of wine, but 
in terms of being the most flattering for food, for a broad diversity of different kinds of food, cider really hits the nail on the head. And so what's wonderful is is when you have events that showcase that diversity. Um, there's the Farm on Adderley dinner. There was a whole pig uh, roast at Breslin on uh, Sunday night that, that Eden um, partnered up with. Uh, you know, there's an event this evening uh, at Bedford Cheese on Irving that is very much about pairing heritage ciders with different kinds of food that you might order for takeout. So dumplings or, you know, a good grilled cheese sandwich, that kind of thing. Um, that sounds it's, really good. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, cider is so expressive and it's so, it really makes food sing. And then Gidon, you just poured a cider for us. What is it? Uh, I poured our rosé and, you know, uh, rosé is obviously rosé cider has obviously become a very big category in the states. This is a rosé made with all freshly pressed New York apples, with the intent of uh, making rosé in the best image of what rosé wine uh, is like. And actually, when you look at the rosé as a category, there are many different um, aspects of what people want to achieve when making rosé cider, which also makes it quite interesting as well. Great. So, so we're we're gonna um, our next Collins coming on. Uh, who wants to give me an intro to Mike Beck from Uncle John's, or does he not need an intro? <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike. I think Mike. I, I can <laughs> give, give us a quick quick intro to no, Mike Beck um, from Ma- Uncle John's. Uh, in Michigan. Mike Beck is a several generation orchardist. Has a very large orchard in St. John's, Michigan, outside of East Lansing. Um, his orchard gets is an institution in the region. They get as many as ten to fifteen thousand people on a weekend during the fall. Um, and also on top of that, he was one of the first two cideries in the state of Michigan. He's been a huge advocate of the category in Michigan, being very active in the, in the Michigan Cider Association as well as Glencap, which is the largest uh, cider competition in the world. Last year, Glencap had as many as fourteen thousand ciders entered. So he's been someone, if you wow. talk to people in the industry, he's also was the president of the New York, uh, of the, New York uh, the Cider Con- Association as well. So he's been one who's always been willing to, uh, um, to lend a helping hand to anyone starting cider and really sort of a special person in the industry. Great. Uh, so, so Mike Beck, are you on the line? I am on the line. And that was a glowing review. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he likes you. I just want to say also that I remember uh, two years ago, I think you invited me to to judge at Glint Cap, and I, I will be back one day. But tell us your spiel, man. We, we, we love you, and we, we want to hear, hear, hear from your mouth. Well, I mean, uh, well, my spiel is, you know, we've been, we're, we're in the not-so-typical growing area of Michigan. Uh, you know, I was right, we're close to East Lansing, which is our home of MSU, and MSU uh, Extension, which helps us growers so much, but most of the growing is over there in the west end of the state. So, um, when we lost our infrastructure, what I mean by that, the local packer about in the 1950s, um, we decided to, or pardon me, in the 1970s, we decided to change our model to a completely retail setup. And we were doing fresh juice for the longest of times, and along with donuts and pick your own this and that and, and other retail things and other just fun things to do on the farm. And I had started to, to see these wineries pop up in Michigan, and I thought to myself, what a great opportunity to add to my retail experience. So in uh, 99, I wrote a grant to the USDA, and I asked them for $50,000, and they turned me down. In 2000, I rewrote that grant, and I asked for $100,000, and they gave me the money. So obviously, they <laughs> didn't ask for enough money the first time around. So that got us off the fence. And uh, by 2002, I think we got our license, and we've been uh, selling retail ever since. I mean, we've always, you know, when I when I was growing up, we always had a barrel of this and that going every winter, uh, just something that you did. I mean, you grew the product, you had the barrels, you had the rooms, uh, do do some at least for yourself. So, so I had some practical knowledge i started boning up on uh, what was put down on scroll and uh and basically i haven't turned back i uh i have no preconceived notion of uh what is the best cider apple or what apple should be used um but I, we're not bad at blending things here and we we learn as we go great eleanor has a question for you so, so Mike is someone who's been so, uh, you know, there from the beginning. Um, 
you know, what do you see as the current trends? You know, how has it changed and what's, what's coming up? Um, trends, uh, probably, uh, pushing the envelope on flavors, uh, and, and different styles, uh, is probably the trends. Um, I've done a little bit of that here, but also package size. I had a very huge, ugly green bottle to start and I have then sent switch to a can, which really changed the game here. And then I've o- I've always kept some things in a in a big bottle uh, that might be a, a bittersweet selection or an heirloom or a perry or something like that. That I've I, I've now kind of given up really hope on that the 750 market is is really there, and I'm downsized to a 500 ml bottle, and maybe that will help push some of these more premium things that that we do. Maybe we call it heritage. I don't know exactly what the terminology we should be using is, but I'm trying to still do the things that we're doing with special fruit and put it into glass bottles and and single serve type. Mike, it's amazing that at one time people put the best ciders in those large 750 wine style bottles and somehow cans have taken over and it seems like people are selling more cider. It's it's absolutely true. Those those 750s can be a little intimidating, especially to the uninitiated. So uh, these smaller packaging formats certainly do help. Great. And uh, Kyle from uh, Graph Cider has a question for you. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, kind of being in America's heartland and being surrounded by you know cider in your in your local area. How much, you know, since you've been in it so long, you've had time to test and, and play around. How much, you know, do, do you guys look to what, what you've seen growing up in your area? And how much do you look to Europe for inspiration at, at this point in, in even your small line products? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I have relied very little on European styles to gain any kind of uh, um, traction here mostly because I probably don't know how to do it. I've never tried to do a Spanish cider. I've been there and tried your ciders. They're, they're wonderful, but I've never tried to recreate. Same with an English cider. I've never even attempted to recreate an English or a French style, really. I'm, uh, I'm kind of a one-trick pony. I'm taking the best fruit I can possibly find and fermenting it and trying to express it. It's, it's an old dicky wine thing that's always used but it's kind of i guess it holds true that's what that's all i'm trying to do here is express the fruit so um and, and that's i i've never tried things like brentum ices or anything I'm, like i'm just not that smart so you're pretty smart I, uh, man <laughs> <laughs> Gideon's gonna try to outsmart you right now uh no uh, actually uh so in the beer industry uh Tap room sales are now 17%, supposedly, of the craft category. You had mentioned to me that your tasting room has become, um, has been, um, um, that the sales have grown steadily every year. Can you talk a little bit about your tasting room and specifically and any specific products which seems to be get, gaining traction um, through your tasting room recently? Oh, oh certainly, yeah. Um, well, yeah, you know, and that's kind of where we started out. We didn't try to sell a cider beyond our our doorstep here for the uh, 2007 or eight, maybe something like that. And, uh, uh, I, I've never, I've always thought it'd be harder for someone to start making cider and just selling it wholesale. You need that tasting room for one to create, for one to get people to try the product to, to, to learn about it, but it also creates some buzz. And uh, and that's what our tasting room, how we're increasing sales, is is, is that buzz, uh, introducing something either seasonally or just one-offs that are just available in the tasting room for a, a short amount of time. Um, so, uh, and we we also do spirits here, and those you know, like I'll do fifty cases of apple brandy, or make it available in September, and it lasts until maybe Halloween. And uh, it's only available here, and that kind of creates a little bit of the buzz to to keep those numbers up in the tasting room. Well, you know, but, my, it's uh, amazing. I, I don't have to try very hard in October and even September, where there's ten to twelve thousand people here in a day. 
uh, sometimes. So they, you I'll know, Mike, it's it's minutes. amazing Wait just to get into yeah what you've done. But the, also, the, the, for we see it nationwide, you know, between Glint Glint Cap and what you did with national associations. I mean, can, can you say that there's a Michigan style of cider? Is there a New York style of cider? I mean, do you, do you see like these regional styles emerging? Or anything like that like, that you want to you want to mention like a big picture? Um, not really so much. I mean, I honestly, I as a as a grower, I I can notice I can see differences in eastern eastern fruit, which includes really the Great Lakes, and western fruit. Uh, people out west can grow so much prettier, bigger apples than anyone that I know in the Great Lakes or out east. Um, However, I think what's inside that apple is far better from eastern cone apples. They're definitely higher in acid, and they're a, a denser apple. And I guess the one thing I can say that's still happening on the east side of the country is there is still more varieties planted in ground in any kind of commercial size than there is out west. So... I can kind of see a, a, a division that might happen from where the fruit, what part of the country the fruit is sourced. And certainly, uh, obviously, varieties take a, a, a big play in that. But that's really, I think, I, I think it's, I don't, I don't know about regional styles yet. I, 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 like I said, I don't know if I'm smart enough to comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can attest to the fact that, Mike, that you know exactly where the northern, all the northern spires are grown in Michigan, where the Baldwins are grown, and you have access to all those great apples, which is obviously a huge advantage. I know you've done a lot of uh, plantings recently. Are there any specific varieties that you're most excited about um, looking forward? Well, on the bittersweet end, I'm, you know, I'll probably stick to pretty much, if I'm going to graft anything in my orchard or plant anything, it'll be dab and that. Everything else is... Uh, kind of uh, uh, not grower-friendly, at least. The Dabonet has proven to be a fairly grower-friendly bittersweet apple. Um, uh, but if, uh, you know, the uh, gold, the standard golden russet we can use for a lot of things in our program. So if that's the one thing that we might push, it'd be uh, golden russet. Great. Hey, Mike, um, can you stay on the line? We're going to take a break in a minute, but quickly, Jen, what was the last cider you poured for us? We are having... Uh, golden... Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on, Mike, one sec. <laughs> we're having Kite and Strings Northern Spy. All right, Which Kite and String Northern yeah, Spy. Exactly. And on that note, we're going to take another short break. We'll be back in a minute. Mike, stay on the air. We'll be right back with you on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio, the special state of the cider industry podcast on Heritage Radio Network. So Jen Smith from the New York Cider Association, uh, Cider Week, New York City, Finger Lakes and all that. How's Cider Week going for you? This has been the most well-attended Cider Week thus far in terms of like the sense of attention attended. Um, you know, we have been doing... a fairly large group event each year as more cider makers get involved with the association and with cider week the event has expanded we're now doing an event with 32 producers all of whom are either pioneering northeastern cider makers like eden and farm hill or our new york that's the big the lower east side cider fest. exactly lower east yeah. cider fest uh in previous years we've had these tastings and we've hit capacity but it's been a, a real process of pushing and pushing and sometimes working with ticket resellers etc this year there's been this wonderful sea change 
we sold the event out completely before I even had a chance to promote it, before I'd sent the first email or made the first social media post saying, Cyderique NYC, November 2nd through 11th. It's, there's a degree of interest in cider and in New York cider specifically that is really affirming. <laughs> you That's know, we've great. been working well, on even this Even the show, time. I mean, just so you know, we've got Mike back on, Mike, you're still there, right? Mike Beck's on the phone from uh, Michigan. Oh, he's off. We just had Mike Beck in from Michigan, Michelle McGrath from U Association. So Guido and Call and, and Ron got together with me a couple months ago and proposed doing this kind of state of the cider industry show. So it's definitely come a long way in terms of interest. Um, what, 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 what made you guys want to do this type of show? Instead of just, usually it's like the producers come on when I talk about their products. But you really wanted to capture this, where the cider industry is going. I think we... Um Gideon and I get together and talk about the cider industry a lot. And, uh, you know, we talk about all our peers. And uh, I think it was, would be fun to just bring it out and have other people contribute to that. Cause and quickly, just big thanks. We had, just had Mike back on from Uncle John's in Michigan. Thank you, Mike, for calling in. And Ron, you know, um, Gideon. I, I agree with Ron. Like, this is a burgeoning industry. We've grown so quickly, so fast. Um, and the issue is, not on top of that, there's obviously so many people that have got involved in the category. And the category is inherently a beautiful category on many levels. The one, the, the complexity of cider, then you take it even a little deeper, the complexity of apples and the history of apples in our country. And I think that a lot of people getting in the industry are getting in for love of it without necessarily a lot of business background. And people are struggling to find out where they are and, and how to uh, make a successful company. I think that that's a challenge for all of us, is how do we continue growing this category and making it a healthy category? And do you guys, I mean, there's different styles, you know, there's progress being made in terms of identifying styles and categories, but do you feel like most people are really open to trying all types of different ciders? Do you feel like it's a really wide open market? Eleanor? Uh, I wish I could say absolutely yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's um, really interesting to me when I'm pouring for the public and I'll get somebody going by, oh, I, don't, I really don't like cider. And I'm always, sort of, well, tell me more, like, what, what don't you like? And they'll say, oh, it's too sweet. And then I'll be like, okay, we'll try. I mean, there are all sorts of dry ciders you could try. Why don't you try some of these? And then I'll get other people who say, oh, you know, I love cider. Let me try that one. And they try a dry one and they're like, ew, that's horrible. <laughs> so I think, you know, people say cider and they think one thing and yet it's so diverse. It's as diverse as wine or beer. You know, before the show, I mean, th there's a lot of parallels to the craft. I don't, I don't always think of as cider and beer being the same, but it seems that a lot of people in the industry are comparing the growth of, of those industries. And not too long ago, even even in beer, you know, not everyone could even say I prefer a pills or was comfortable saying what an IPA is. And I think that now, you know, the general consumer knows what an IPA is. They know what a pills is. They they, they know some styles and and they know what to expect. I Kyle. think I, I think one thing you know I, I don't want to you know just talk too much about it since it's the state of the cider industry. But one thing that you know before before Graft uh, had started Millstone. And I'd been in the industry about five years, and one of the big things I saw that was important was the creation of, of styles. So, you know, one of the great things about the cider industry is, you know, everyone kind of has their own microphone to tell their own story. So we just created styles out of thin air and kind of rolled with them. And, um, you know, maybe some of them will stick, maybe some of them won't. But I think creating styles within the category that consumers can look to, I mean, I know that... Um, uh, beer menus took, you know, for a long, long time, it was just cider, cider, cider. You see this same kind of war being fought for the draft lines where you have 19 styles of beer, one style of cider. And it's like, I think they were getting to a point, hopefully, hopefully it's a big uphill battle, but hopefully where consumers with, with all these new producers in local markets having to fight tooth and nail and exposing the crowd to new things, hopefully we'll see an extra cider line added for the people that want something dry or, in, you know, something something outside of just Angry Orchard, Crisp, and all those things. You know, Kyle, what you've done is really uh, unbelievable because you came in with Graft just, what, two years ago? Yep, just to celebrate and it. You've, you've got a, a, a beer distributor in New York, and sometimes the way you market or label the, the product, and I put it on draft, people would think it was a beer because you had a goes a cider. You, you use terms from beer. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the big uphill battles right now. It's, you know, the, there's kind of two camps of cider. It's it's wine or beer. And, and for us, you know, we thought at the end of the day, we really have to identify with a beer crowd. And But the thing is, we think we have a flavor profile insider that appeals to the beer crowd. They just don't know it yet. 
and by giving them these easy layup terms that they already understand because most people don't you know think about beer styles or styles or what they're gonna drink alcoholically you know day in day out the way most of the people in the industry do so you know we have to keep create easy pathways and easy doors for them to open i always say if you're confused as hell by a product, you're not going to pick it up and take it home with you. So make it very, very simple. And sometimes that means bending the truth. Like at the end of the day, is it a Goza cider? Is it from Gossinger, Germany and use salt water and malts and blah, blah, blah? No, but they get the idea and it's still representation, representational of that style. And then, Alan, are you, you've gone through a lot of changes too. You started out with uh, uh, ice cider and now you're making really great sparkling dry ciders too. Yeah, I think what Kyle said earlier about, you know, the, the innovation that happens here in the U.S., I, somebody asked me a few days ago, like, so how many ciders do you make? And I was, like, counting on my fingers, and I was like, uh, 22. <laughs> so, do you really? Yeah. Wow. Um, so everything from, from ice ciders to these crazy aperitifs under our Orleans brand to, you know, our main champagne method and um, cellar series, and then we just introduced a can for the first time, which is still a heritage cider made like wine, but it's in a can. We're going to taste that next. And then, you know, Jen Smith, uh, New York Cider Association, there was one issue you had mentioned. Uh, do you, are you working on some kind of dryness scale? Because we're talking about dry ciders. What is dryness? Yeah, we are. So of, of real importance to the industry writ large is helping ground consumers in this notion that cider is not inherently sweet um, and also educating them about what dry is. And so we, the New York Cider Association, in partnership with some folks from elsewhere in the country, have developed a dryness scale that's a perceived dryness scale. So we're calling it right now the orchard-based uh, the orchard-based cider dryness scale. And, uh, you know, even USACM in the CCP materials acknowledges that the three important apple chemical characteristics are sugar, acid, and tannin. And our scale uses those three elements to arrive at a degree of dryness. So it's complex and scientific on the back end. However, for consumers, it's a real simple dry, semi-dry, semi-sweet, sweet. Where does the cider fall? Hash mark there. Bob's your uncle. You know, very simple, sort of zero to four. I want Bob's your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> uncle John, that's what I want. <laughs> but then, you know, it's funny because earlier today we were talking... Uh, I, I, I and probably many people think of you as running the Cider Weeks around New York State, but you're actually doing a lot more for cider and, and farms, aren't you? Sure. I, the, the Cider Association has twinned objectives, market development for New York cider makers and ensuring industry viability. And that means working with partners at the state level. Uh, it means working with research institutions were blessed in the state to have Cornell University and the Cornell Cooperative Extension Program. Um, identifying ways to engage with apple growers, such an important part of our state economy. Educating apple growers. And then, you know, as sort of a, a facet of Cider Week that, that sometimes gets overlooked, we're really about educating the gatekeepers. So there's a lot of opportunities for direct consumer, drinker, interaction during Cider Week, but we're really hoping to to grab and turn into evangelists the bartenders, the sommeliers, the, you know, beer bottle shop owners, etc., to get them to understand what cider can be. You know, it's funny, Gide and I first met you over 20 years ago. You were just selling original sin cider. You came to a bar I owned, and I, I gave you a lot of shit because I, I felt like you, you were in a new category, and, and the way you were marketing was was very different. Uh, let's see, on that level, yeah, I remember walking in 20 years ago and speaking to you, and you had me sit down with you, and even at that point, when cider was almost a non-category, you, you envisioned cider becoming large, So, it, which it obviously has grown so significantly. It's all because um, of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and you, bro. <laughs> but your enthusiasm over the year has obviously been very significant. I, I would add to what Jen's saying about Cornell University. Um, one very critical element of Cornell is Greg Peck and what they're working. The graduate students at Cornell University are doing. Here, here. Yeah, in terms of experimental work with cider apple specifically. And historically in England, the Long Ashton Research Center outside of Bristol had a very significant role in improving English ciders. And I feel Cornell is doing the same thing currently with also trying to advocate what apples we need to grow in order to improve um, the cider we're making in the future. So That's great. And uh, Kyle, you know, 
Graft, to me, Graft is a big deal in New York City. You're in the Hudson Valley. Mm -hmm. You had been making cider in Maryland. Why did you come to the Hudson Valley? Why did you come to New York State? There's a bunch of reasons. Some of them are marketing-based. Um, but I think I think one of the things that still rings true is that at the end of the day, it must have some, you know, the, the density of, of cideries, the density of apple resources, and the density of people that have been turned on because there's so many small producers in the area it is extremely valuable. I mean, this is one of the, so we make several different styles of cider, farm floor being our rustic kind of table cider. And this is one of the states where that still outperforms because at the end of the day, people have been educated and they're excited about, you know, different, many different styles, all based on the apple, which is, is a testament to the kind of ground guerrilla marketing that all these cideries have had to do to get us to there. That's great. And then uh, we're going to close out this, this segment in a minute, but I'm holding in my hand a can of Eden cider. You know, when, from the time I've known you, Eleanor, I thought of Eden as one of the finer ciders. We talked about labels. Now you're a heritage cider. I love what you're doing. And, and to see it in a can, it's, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? Um, it's, it's a big leap for us. Um, but we wanted to really have that can communicate that it's a different kind of cider than most ciders in cans. And it's one of the few labels where you find the names of the orchards where the apples were grown and the names of the varieties that are in it. And there's nothing in it but apples. You know, one other change, not too long ago, seven years ago, guys like you and, you know, Steve Wood at Farm Hill were just had ciders in the 750 bottles. I think Steve at the time only had one sparkling cider. He was just doing a still cider. But suddenly he had a, a, a sparkling cider on draft. And then you came out a few years later with, with a draft. What was that jump for you? I mean, it, it seems obvious now, but. Yeah, well, we, um, so we've always been very focused on restaurants because of ice cider. Like, nobody would ever taste an ice cider except maybe by the glass on a dessert menu. So that was our main focus. And when we started going into straight ciders, we were listening to our customers saying 750 is tough because you know, people don't want to buy. It's a risky purchase. One person at the table likes cider. Everybody else is having wine, and they don't want to buy a 750. And if we open the bottle, the rest of it's going to go flat. And so can you please put it in a keg or in a smaller bottle? So that's what we did. Yeah, actually, I want to ask Eleanor a question. Um, so Eleanor recently opened up a tap room outside Burlington. I'd love to hear more about the tap room. I'm actually looking forward to going up there myself. So you could talk more about your tap room. Um, so uh, we, our cidery is up in the northeast kingdom of Vermont. We have more cows than people. Um, and so it's kind of hard to sell cider to cows. Um, and so we, we just, yeah, they don't have a lot of money either. Exactly. So we really decided we needed to open a tap room where there were people. They're not rich cows. <laughs> um, and what we wanted to do is in this tap room is it's a, we're calling it a boutique tap room and cheese bar. Um, and we have a really fantastic cheese program that goes along with it because cheese and cider just sh sh share so many, um, uh, values in terms of you know agricultural based products and and fermentation and flavors and um, and so we also are trying to educate people about the history of cider. So we've got um, you know sp uh, a European cheese plate with something from Ast Asturias and something from Normandy and something from the West Country of England, um, and then we have a Vermont cheese plate and we have styles of cider that um, the company does so they get a sense of the traditions. Wow, this is really cool. This is only our first hour, uh, the state of the cider industry on Beer Sessions Radio. Uh, we're going to take a break. I want to give a big shout-out to everyone. Go around the room one more time. S please say your name to, to the audience. Yeah, uh, Kyle uh, from Graf Cider. Uh, Ron from Spoken Spy Cider. Uh, Guido Ancola with Original Sin. Eleanor Leger, Eden Ciders. Jen Smith, New York Cider Association. Great. Thanks for joining us. Big shout-out to our producer, Justin Kennedy, engineer, Matt Patterson, intern, Dylan. Uh, we'll be back in, very shortly at uh, 5 o'clock for our second segment of uh, the State of the Side Industry on Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you soon. Bye. All right. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. 
And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.